Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you here today. I, I've met some visitors, and so we're so happy to have you with us. And as was mentioned a little bit earlier, 60 to 70 of our, our family members are on their way back from Kansas City this morning, including Greg and Trish. And so that's why I'm here. And uh, if you uh, don't know who I am, don't know my name, I've actually worn my name tag, and it's... Mike. 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 Thank you very much. And for those of you online, it's great to have you with us, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I got a text uh, this week from, uh, from James. Uh, Wessel normally sits up here, and they were in a car accident. And so they're saying they, they're, they're okay, but they're not able to join us, so I'm going to special greeting out to, uh, to Joe and James. Good to have you guys on, online this morning. And for all the others that are on joining us regularly, or maybe, maybe you're new. It's welcoming. Thank you for joining us. And, you know, I was really trying to think about what I wanted to talk about this morning, and being at Easter, I think it was kind of obvious where my mind went. But as, as the weeks led up to this, I, th I thought it was very interesting that a lot of the things that were said at the communion table or by Greg all kind of led right or talked about the things I was going to talk about. And so I thought to myself, well, now what am I going to do? It's all been said. But then I got to think, you know what? Maybe the Spirit wants us to hear it multiple times. You know, we have four Gospels. We hear, get to hear the account of Christ's life in four <clears throat> different ways. And, and so I just trudged on. And so uh, we're going to be talking about what I wanted to talk about. Uh, and, and thank you all for, for contributing to my lesson before you even knew it. So thank you so much. Um, Suzanne said it was okay for me to not wear a tie. So I'm not wearing a tie this morning, and if you have a problem with that, she's sitting right over there. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah. Um, so I'd like to spend some time this morning uh, talking about the resurrection, but not what we might typically hear about the resurrection. I'm not going to talk about Easter bunnies and colored eggs. I'm not going to talk about Christ's crucifixion. As powerful as that is, and as we remember that, thank you, Mike, for reading that, in our thoughts and in remembering Christ's sacrifice. I want to talk this morning about how we can share in the joy of the resurrection, the same joy that the Christians of the first century experienced. How can we experience that today? It, it's in my mind that we need to see the resurrection as something that we have also experienced. Something that applies to me and to you. And it's something that, that God has prov provided an opportunity for us to witness and to experience. You know, we read, we read scripture often, and you probably have, maybe you have your daily Bible reading and things that we hear scripture a lot. And so I'm going to share several scriptures about different aspects of the, re about the resurrection. The first one talking about just basically the, the fact that the power of the res resurrection. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 6, chapter, four, chapter 6, verse 4. For we are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 8, 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. And then part of, the, part of the section that Mark read this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has been raised, actually, I don't know that you read this part. I think this is later. Matthew 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. So there's a correlation and a connection between Christ's resurrection and the forgiveness of our sins. And so these are very powerful verses about the resurrection. That we read, maybe we know these verses, maybe we've memorized these verses. And then let's read some more verses about the promise of our resurrection. John 11.25 says, Jesus said to her, 
I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Romans 6, 5. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, according to the Lord's word, I think it's interesting that he says that, because this is something that he was specifically inspired to speak and to write by God and by the Spirit. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not proceed those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. Man, won't that be something? And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left, left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so it will be, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Wow, what an encouragement. Something that we are aspire to and look forward to. And, and the effects of the resurrection on our life need to run deep. And here, here are a couple of, of ideas that I just want to throw out there for your consideration with regard to the resurrection. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we can be renewed. We are new. Those things that we struggle with, those things that we battle, we have victory over them in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to, be, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we have all of these verses that we've probably heard over and over again throughout our Christian walk. Maybe they're new to you. Maybe you haven't heard them. But, but I want us to understand that there, there's a challenge in reading the Bible. There's a huge challenge in reading the Bible. And the, that's the fact that, that we can have the idea that these events took place 2,000 years ago. And because of that time distance it might cause us to view Scripture in ways that God has not desired or intended. I call this the challenge of being chronologically challenged. We become simple observer, observers of the things that we read about in Scripture. Oh yeah, that happened back then. Yeah, sure did. Sure did. I'm an observer. I saw it or I heard about it. That's good. We read about the things and perceive these events with a mindset that they happened thousands of years ago, and we begin to see them as just stories. Now, Greg has this phrase, don't get me started. And we all kind of, I think most of us who know, have been here a while, know what he's talking about. Well, I have, I have a don't get me started, and it's this word stories. Don't get me started talking about this word stories. Stories are like Lord of the Rings. That's a story. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek, <laughs> that's a story. It's a saga. <clears throat> scriptures are not stories, in my mind. Scriptures are truth, are history, are fact. And so, and so again, this cr chronological conundrum that we have of being so distant, I think it causes us sometimes to see Scripture as stories. Oh, we talk about the stories of the Bible. Don't get me started. We talk about the need for our young kids to understand the stories of the Bible. Don't get me started. Yes, we have to have our kids understand what Scripture says. We have to get them to understand that God has worked throughout history and those things happened and they're real, as bizarre as some of them might be. Water coming from a rock? Are you kidding me? We heard, we heard Greg talk about that. We've heard the, the, the kids talk about that during, in the preparation. There's some really amazing things. The Red Sea party. Not a story. Fact. Pillar of fire, a cloud. Not a story. A fact. The Son of God coming to earth. 
not a story, a fact, history. Jesus rising from the dead, not a story, a fact, history, documented history. We have repeated numerous documented evidence of all of these facts that happened throughout history. And so I want us to think about, as we think about the resurrection and we think about the power of Scripture, I want us to really ask the question in our own minds, how do I perceive these events? Do they impact me? Do they affect me? And so as we think about the resurrection, and we think about the significance, I read all those verses. What did you hear? Did, 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 you, did you think about them as they related to you? Or did you say, oh, well, that Paul wrote that, and he wrote that to those people? And I, I want to challenge us to think about Scripture as it relates to us and about our involvement in it. At times, I think we, and I, I'm guilty of this, I can read a scripture and I can, I can break it apart and be all analytical about it, you know, kind of like a zoologist studies the animal life and they can see the behaviors and look at all, without regard to the, what, what the word was speaking. Or maybe an archaeologist digs and finds the ancient civilizations and they try to recreate all, try to understand what took place back then. But the reality of our work, of our walk with God is those events took place at a time in which God acted there, but it also reminds us that God is acting today. So, so my, my title for my lesson today is, how do we bring the past to the present? How do we, how do we make scripture alive and relevant and affecting our lives today? And so that's what I want to talk about with regard to the resurrection. Uh, movie makers and uh, storytellers have been trying to bridge this chronological gap in, for, for years. Uh, and often the way they do it is they, they, they have a, a time machine. Or for you Trekkie fans or sci-fi fans, there's a break in the space-time continuum. I love that one. It sounds so techy, so, so, so scientific. Or how about Back to the Future with the DeLorean doing some weird thing with lightning. I'm sure you can think of your own Examples, maybe you're not a sci-fi person, so you never watch a, a time travel type movie, but I do. Um, and all of these are an attempt to get the people, the watcher, the, the listener, to get a grasp of what it was like, how it affected people. And I would like to suggest to you that God, in his infinite wisdom, has given us a time machine. Yeah, I haven't lost it really. <laughs> God has given us a time machine. We can go back into history. We can see what God did and how it affected the lives of the people back then. And we can, we can witness it firsthand. Well, actually, on the account of a firsthand. So I guess that's secondhand, right? So we can witness it through the eyes of somebody who witnessed it who experienced it. But not only do we go back, but I think the, the relevance for us today is that we bring it forward. We bring God's life and example and actions and history, not just, and don't leave it back there, we can actually bring it forward to our lives today. And that's what I want us to think about today as we think about the resurrection. few facts about scripture. Most of you may know this, but for the benefit of those who don't, I want to share some amazing things about this collection of documents. There are 66 different writings, books, we call them books. 66 different books, get this, written over 1,500 years. 1,500. 66 books written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. 40 from three continents 
different nations, different cultures, in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, they all have one theme. All of that, all of those collective writings over 1,500 years have one theme, and that is God's love for his creation, his desire to redeem it, and how he did it, and how he's doing it. So I think this is a pretty reliable time machine for us to rely on in understanding what God has done and is doing in our lives. I also think it's absolutely amazing that God has preserved his word for thousands of years. We talked about scripture being written over 1,500 years, but it has been preserved far longer than that. God, through his Jewish people, through his Israelite people, have, have retained the old portion of God's story. And then God, through his spirit, has inspired men to write and record things of the life of Jesus that have perpetuated even today over 2,000, not quite 2,000 years. 3,500 years. And God has preserved his word. Why? Not so we can just read some historical document about something that happened 1,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. So that we, as his people, can understand who he is and what he wants of us and what he's doing in our lives. I'm going to read again the passage that, that Mark read today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to start with verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scripture, and that he appeared to, to Peter, and then to the twelve, and after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren, brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then also the apostles, and, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one untimely born. Jesus appeared to hundreds of people after his resurrection. So the question I have for you is, is how did you hear that? Now, I kind of spoiled it because I kind of told you where I'm going with this, but, but how did you hear that? Oh, yeah, okay, 500 people, yeah, okay, that's, that's me, 12, 12 apostles, James, Paul, cool, neat facts. Those were our brothers and sisters. Do you, do you grasp the significance of that? They were our brothers and sisters. And the apostles, as they walked the earth, you know, we, read, we can read Paul talking about how God gave some as apostles, some as teachers, some as prophets, and we can say, oh, well, we have apostles today. Well, you know what, brothers and sisters? They're our apostles. They're our apostles. So he has given us apostles. So, so this whole time gap causes us to have this thinking that, well, they're different than us, or we're separate from them. But when we try to take care of that, we try to remove the distance of time and put ourselves in recognizing that the people that we read about in the New Testament, they're our brothers and sisters, just like you're my brother and you're my sister. Just like our brothers and sisters at Eastside are our brothers and sisters. Just like our brothers and sisters at Castle Rock are our brothers and sisters. It's no different. They're our brothers and sisters. And when Jesus comes back and takes us home, we'll all be together. Time can be a huge barrier if we allow Satan to use it as such. And so as we think about, think about the New Testament, as we think about our part in it and its part in us, I would like to suggest that we can hear about Christ's resurrection in the same way that the first century church experienced it. See, because what's interesting about the first century church is, I would say, predominant majority of them never saw Christ. Never saw him. They only heard about him. They heard about him through the preaching of the apostles. They heard about him through the preaching of Paul, apostle. And so they heard about him. 
And then after, after they were done hearing about him, they read about him. Because the Spirit inspired men to continue, continue the story. Oh, I used that word, didn't I? Continue the history of what Christ did. And so, if you, if you really think about it, we're no different than that. We are, we are as close to Christ as they were. Are you getting it? We are as close to Jesus' walk on the earth as they were. Man, that gives me chills. So does it make a difference that the first-hand account was one year ago? Ten years ago? We read about things that happened ten years ago. We feel pretty connected to that. How about a hundred years ago? Does it matter that the first-hand account was written a hundred years ago? Does it matter that the first-hand account of something took place a thousand, two thousand years ago? We have the first-hand account as if it happened last week. So we have been brought near to Christ through God's Word. The time machine is working if we will, will but let it work in our lives. How am I doing for time? Doing good. Right on track. I'd like to tell you about something that happened not long ago. Early in the morning on the third day, after the death and burial of the one that we have come to know as Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ. One of his closest followers, Mary Magdalene, was going to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus for his final burial. And when she got to the tomb, she saw that the stone had been removed. And she was she was frightened. Just think about what Mary was preparing to do to the body of Jesus. And think about the condition of the body of Jesus that she was preparing to anoint with oil. So she had her mind fixed on that, and she's going to the tomb and sees the open tomb, and her expectations are blown. And so what does she do? She, she runs to our brother Peter and our brother Paul, and she says, the stone has been removed. They've taken the Lord's body. And so our brothers Peter and Paul, they run to the tomb. They run, and, and John, Peter and Paul, no, John, John and Peter. John and Peter run to the tomb. John's faster than Peter, so he gets there first, and he looks inside. And then Peter, being Peter, he doesn't just stop and look inside. He runs into the tomb, and he sees it's empty. And after John seeing Peter run into the tomb, what's interesting is, is when Peter runs into the tomb, he's actually making himself unclean in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish religion. But he doesn't care. He wants to see what's there or what isn't there. So Peter runs into the tomb, and then John sees that Peter's going in. He follows him. And they see the linen lying on the place where Jesus had laid. And they see that he is gone. Doesn't that sound just like Peter? Running straight on to, into the tomb. It reminds you of, of what he did in jumping out of the boat to walk on water. So when our brothers, John and Peter, saw that the tomb was empty, when our brothers... John and Peter saw the linens folded neatly. They remembered what our Savior said, that he would rise. He would rise on the third day. And they were excited, and they ran out of that tomb. But you know what? Mary had followed them to the tomb. She didn't see what they saw at that moment. She didn't experience what they experienced at that time, but she was outside the tomb when they left. And so Mary approached the tomb again and looked inside. 
and this special precious disciple of Jesus, our sister, she saw two angels, one at the head and one at the foot where Jesus' body had been laying. And she didn't recognize him in the angels, and so she says, if you have taken the body, please tell me where it is. And not getting a response, she turns to leave from the tomb, and there was somebody behind her, and, and, and he says, why are you crying? And Mary says, thinking he's the gardener, if you have taken his body, please tell me where it is so that, so that I can go get it. And then this man says, Mary. Mary. And she recognizes him. She says, Rabbi, teacher, she has seen the risen Lord. She's seen him, and she's holding on to him. And, and Jesus says, don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Rather, go tell, go tell my disciples that I have risen. Go tell them before I ascend. I think it's interesting that Jesus by then affirms and reconfirms who he is. He is the Son of God. He says, before I ascend to my Father. Mary then went and told the disciples. She told them that all that she had experienced. You see, what was interesting is John and Peter had not seen Jesus yet. They had not seen him. They had only seen the empty tomb. Mary was the first to see Jesus alive. And she went, she, as she was instructed, to go tell the disciples. And that night, our brothers and sisters were gathering in the room, because, you know, they were fearful of the Jews. They didn't know what, what they might be accused of or convicted of. So they were so were fearful. So they, had, they were meeting in this room, and the doors were locked because they didn't want to be disturbed. And our Savior, the risen Lord, appears in their midst without opening the door, without going through the door. And what does he say? He says, peace be with you. I don't know about you, but if I was in that room, and I had heard that Jesus rose from the dead, because Peter and John, I'm sure, were telling him all about that, and Mary told him all about that, and he shows up without walking through the door, I would have been a little freaked out, surprised. So Jesus So Jesus says to, to our brothers and sisters in that upper room, he says, see my hands, see my side. And when they had seen and touched, they believed. Our brothers believed at that moment that the Savior has risen from the dead. Christ isn't in that tomb. He has risen from the dead. And they believed. But one of our brothers, Thomas, wasn't there. He didn't get to see that. He didn't get to experience that. And so, so when, the, when our brothers, our, our, the other disciples, told him about what they'd experienced and, and the amazing, just how amazing that was, he said, well, unless I see his hands and I see his side and put my hands on him, I am not going to believe. And what's really amazing is one week later, our Savior went back to that same room where those same disciples, our same brothers and sisters were gathered there meeting. And again, he walked, he shows up in the room without going through the doors. And all the other people say, oh, this is, this is, we've done this before, seen that, been there, done that. But Thomas, this is his first time. And what does Jesus do? What, is, what does our Savior do for Thomas? He says, Thomas, put your hand in the hole Put your finger there. 
put your hand in my side and experience what these others have already experienced. I think it's absolutely amazing that Jesus gave Thomas the exact same encounter that they had. Validating their words. Everything that they had told Thomas was he experienced right then and there. And so what, what happens then? Thomas is, is on his knees. He said, my Lord, my God, he believed that our Christ, our Savior, has risen. And I also find it interesting and powerful that Jesus tells Thomas, you know, you believe. You see him believe. But get this. Here's the punchline. Blessed are those who believe yet have not seen. That's, the, that's you. That's the people that have, have experienced, have had a relationship with Christ ever since the first century. Jesus was talking about us. Blessed are we who have not seen but still believe. And we can believe because we have this time machine where we have gone back in and we have, by the first-hand accounts, heard exactly what happened and what, what people saw and experienced. So the story that I've been telling you? No, I'm not going to say that word again. I just did. <laughs> this event that took place not long ago, time is relative, isn't it? With God, time is, he's outside of time. So I'm not, I'm not stretching the truth when I say it happened a while ago. It did, it happened a while ago. But what do we think about it? How do we perceive it? About 30 years after the events that I told you about, the Holy Spirit inspired our brother John to write exactly about what he experienced. And you know, you can find that exact writing right here. And you can find this exact account of what he experienced and saw at the end of his letter, if you are interested in hearing and reading about that. So the scriptures that I read earlier today in, our, in the lesson, the, the, the account that I've referred to in, in John, yeah, they, they were written a long time ago. But we have a choice to make. Will we see them as 2,000 years ago? Distant, objective, unaffected? Or we will recognize, will we recognize that the fact they happened just a while ago to our brothers and sisters, to our family? And they affect us today. They impact our lives today. The power of the resurrection changes lives. The early Christians were so affected by the impact of the resurrection that even though they hadn't seen Jesus, they had a greeting, and Greg shared, with, shared that with you last week, and he's also mentioned it in the past. They would say, he has risen. And then the, the response would be, he has risen indeed. Not just because it's a really cool thing to say. He has risen indeed. It's something they experienced and heard about and knew, for to, knew to be true. Is that how we respond? So if I was to say he has risen and you replied he has risen indeed, are you just saying it to, to mimic? Or are you saying it because you know it to be true by your own experience and study and li listening? So I'm going to say it. And I want to ask you to, to think about how the resurrection has impacted you when you respond. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. So the question that I want to present as I close is, are we going to choose to be affected by the resurrection in our lives? Or will we fall into the trap of our chronological disabilities? We have a choice to make. Let's pray together. Our holy God, we are so incredibly grateful, Lord, for your word that has, 
has bring that brings your involvement and your action in your creation into our lives today and will for as long as time exists and father we thank you that you have preserved first-hand accounts so that we can rely on and, and, and apply and know with certainty, God, of your power of the resurrection and all of the effects of the resurrection on our lives. The assurance of our resurrection. We're anticipating that day. Lord, come quickly. We long for that day. The transformation that we have through the blood of Christ into a new creature. God, those things are for us and thank you for giving us those things. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for this body of believers that we can, we can share in your resurrection together. And as we reflect on our brothers and sisters in the time of Christ, we recognize them as our family, as our Christian spiritual family, who we will one day see when we meet you in the air. Father, thank you for this body of believers here at tri -Lakes. And I thank you, Lord, for for how you work in our lives. Open our eyes, open our heart to see your hand at work through the resurrection in our lives. I pray in Christ's name, amen. So uh, in our congregation, we have a, a tradition that we offer an opportunity. If, if you would like to respond in any way to the lesson or to share a, a prayer, a, a need, or, 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 a, or a praise, um, the elders will, will be in the back. Uh, if you want to make that known as we go ahead and stand together and sing together. 